ideally you want to use I square C because if you use spy for your device, you're limiting what other capes you can use. Uh, since there's only two spy buses that are outputted on the uh, on the Beagle Bone. Uh, most sensors come in high square C. Uh, all, all the weather cape sensors are uh, I square C. Uh, what pins you're going to use? Uh, this actually goes into later on in my slides. So I'll show a cape bus. Uh, but when, you're, when, you're, when you have a limited amount of pins, uh, like even though they're all heavily muxed, uh, you've got you to pick which actual physical pin uh, something's coming out in, and you don't want to have interfering with another cape. Uh, when you're designing a cape, uh, there's some software you've got to take into consideration. For instance, all capes have an EEPROM that listens on four different uh, XPRC addresses. Uh, you would toggle them with a dip switch. Uh, and this has an identification string, and also the pin configuration on the EEPROM. Uh, you want to have little inter intervention <coughs> on the user to set up a cape. Uh, also, a device tree uh, natively isn't really made for capes because you would have to build your own device tree per cape, uh, per actual uh, board. Uh, with Cape Bus, it allows you to define <coughs> capes, and it basically can see off the uh, actual off the uh, EEPROM identification string uh, it's to actually set up the board versus device tree, which soon anything you define is actually on that uh, board. Also, it can detect conflicts. If you have two capes that conflict, uh, you can just go into fail safe and not uh, uh, enable both which can cause a hardware fault. Uh, you want to use sys uh, file system runtime changes whenever you can. Uh, just something that's uh, accessible from user space without uh, memory mapping registers or something insane like that. Uh, actually, you want to have some actual uh, working software on your, uh, before you consider your paid project complete. Uh, Demo apps don't count or just test apps. Uh, something that actually runs is always helpful. Uh, here's an example of a device tree with a cape bus for the tiger cape. As you can see, it just is setting up the pin controls for the, on the actual on the expansion headers, uh, setting up the PMW uh, period uh, cycle, the duty cycle, and the period frequency. And it's also setting up the event at GPIO, which is also it's the only output. It's a singular click. Uh, here's this continue. This is just the LEDs part. This is my LED and the event LED.
Also, uh, for remote stations, if you're going to be running off battery, you need to take into account for your, you can take that into account for power usage. Uh, enable the power save governor. This is a good example. You can save about 30 milliamps. Uh, my non-scientific just uh, random test with the shun resistor. Uh, another thing is you can just, uh, change your sample update rate if you don't need something updating every second, maybe upload every minute. Uh, this is coming to play for using Wi-Fi for your uh, reporting structure. I mean, uh, instead of having a constant Wi-Fi connection, you could have take the Wi-Fi down, uh, queue up the last 60 seconds of data, uh, bring up the connection, push it, bring it down again. Say you a lot of battery. Uh, you want to offload any data processing off your device if you can. Have graphing, for instance. Uh, here's, an, here's actually all the subsystems used for the weather cape and the Geiger cape. As you can see the people bone, the top, the device tree, plus the cape bus, which uh, configures the pins, and also, and hence, also the I2C, one wire, uh, GPIO pulse width modulation settings. All for it. Uh, <clears throat> here's, an ex here's an example of uh, the Geiger counter reporting flow. Uh, the irrigation events. The pulse is extended. Uh, an actual pulse of about 50 microseconds, so that's kind of short for the GPIO uh, interrupt to detect. So we just extend it to about a millisecond. So. Uh, then the COSM reporting script then uploads it to COSM, then it grabs and sends out the alerts. Uh, here's, a, here's a slide of the pins that are used for the uh, Geiger cake. Green is brown, red is the power supplies. Uh, all the modulation pin. Purple is I square C, which is really only used for the identification EEPROM. Uh, black is the analog in for the voltage feedback measurement. Uh, back to sensor selection, uh, you, again, uh, you get what you pay for in, uh, in uh, features of quality. Uh, Geiger tubes are no exception to this. Uh, we had two uh, tubes that we were deciding uh, against. Well, deciding and it's uh, finals. Uh, it's an LED uh, 712 and SBT9. Uh, so we need, we need to take into effect uh, dead time for the tubes. That's between how many microseconds between that uh, <coughs> between the counts. Uh, there's it's basically a Geiger tube's a large capacitor. And that's basically the charge time where you can detect another event. Uh, also, the sensitivity. Usually, the more expensive the tube is, the more sensitive it is. Obviously, the case. Uh, the LED 712 we picked that one because it's more available. Uh, it's also the most expensive. It's about 70 bucks per tube. Uh, also, of course, the voltage for this vary. The uh, only pick need 500 volts. They get most Soviet tubes need only about 300 to 400 volts. But they're not as sensitive. Uh, you hmm? you get the Yeah. Have, well, I have one. Yeah. So. so uh, and then they're all a little bit. Yeah. Also, it's, it's kind of hard to find that. It's hard to get that North America. So that was one reason we picked the other. Like I said, the tube just the tube just a large capacitor that gets charged up. Current stops flowing, so when an ionizing radiation hits it, it's, it's an overcharge that has to go somewhere, and that registers a count on the counterpart of the circuit. Uh, also, there's logic level uh, and pulse shifter on that you need to have. Since you can't have 500 volts going to your uh, to your uh, GPIO line, that's kind of bad. So you need to have a you need to have that shifted, and also in that shifter, it also extends it uh, 
event to a millisecond versus the about 15 microseconds that it is initially. Uh, some safety, most sensors are, most uh, telemetry projects are probably not going to have to think about safety in this context, but since the, you're dealing with highest voltage, even though there's really no current, still can, still can hurt, it's still going to bite if you get hit the 600 volts, even though there's no current. So you want to keep your high voltage traces as short as possible in your design. Uh, the analog, use an analog in for measuring the feedback voltage. Then again, all, all of, although most almost no current is flowing, it still can be dangerous. <clears throat> also, uh, the MOSFET for the uh, boost converter, uh, it can be started at 100%, which can be pretty bad. You're going to have it overheat. Uh, to resolve this, I mean, K plus can't you see here for this because yeah. Well, if you have misconfigured soft software, you could uh, still insert it on. So to resolve this, you want to have a I square C G bio expander that allows you to turn the cape on and off. So you don't. So it has to be initialized for uh, has to be initialized before it's turned on, so you can't don't overheat anything. Uh, also, you want to use a current limiter. We're going to be doing something with the boost converter. This you can force the system reset on the assist reset pin, or you can just turn off your cape in that case. Uh, yeah, the, this, we, this is my actual demo here, just a Geiger cape uh, prototype with the uh, LED ND712 too. Also has the uh, added group uh, get the key, uh, spy interface. Play, and the little bone for FA6. Uh, this I don't actually have here, it's actually at home, but I have a slide that shows what it's uh, operating as a graph. Uh, just a prototype with the other two that we're just tying against, the Soviet one. Uh, it has a weather cape and it's also a FA6. Uh, here's an example of the weather cape and the radiate the Geiger cape uh, showing a graph. You can see the pressure, the temperature, the humidity, uh, ambient light, and what? And where's the Geiger come? Uh, the count's permitted to get there. Uh, just in case you want to see the final design, the uh, this is done at Eagle. Uh, you see the identification EEPROM down there, boost, boost uh, converter up there, and counters, the counterparts down in the lower left. Oh, uh, yeah, lessons learned. Uh, know what functionality your device has and uh, use it. Uh, avoid bit banging interfaces that are already available. Oh, I had to put this in here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, make sure you think of it as a, a Beagle phone as a microprocessor uh, unit and not a microcontroller. So if it goes to bit banging, you don't want to be using one application on the device. Uh, again, watch your initial states. The example I gave you here would be the bad. And, also, modulation pin that's shared with GPIO. There's a couple other mugs that way. If they get sort of um, as an output and true, and you're going to have a bad, you're going to have a bad day. Uh, also, K plus will not save you every time. If you have, uh, if you have a pin that has a, a high pull up resistor, and another one has a lower pull up. Obviously, a, that's a hardware problem. You can't solve that. And you can have a short that way. Or not short, but over current. Uh, watch the logic voltage level. Uh, make sure you use uh, sensors that can use 3.3 volts. If not, you can see there is a cheap uh, logic converting spark fund for about two bucks. You can uh, 
logic should, you can shut the voltage from 5 to 3.3 3 volts. Uh, always test on the breadboard first. Uh, that will save you a lot of headaches and shorting out your $90 board. Uh, if you're going to use the analog in, uh, that's an absolute 1.8 volt limit. You're going to want to make sure you use some thinner diodes. Uh, and, I, and ideally, you want to keep it away from 1.8 volts unless you need the full 12 bits of resolution. Uh, actually, I'm going to show you the demo of the
beta, gamma, or alpha. So when you say one to one, it's a one. Yeah, actually, yeah. One count per hour is one millisiever, microsiever? No, it's permanent. <coughs> there's, okay. a, there's a conversion factor. Okay. You're sort of one to one. Oh, yeah, sorry. No, actually, it's, uh, let's see, it's eight counts per minute, so yeah, it's eight micros, it's 0 0.09 microsieverts per hour. So it's at 100. <coughs> with, the, with the extender, the pulse extender, um, I'm a software guy, so I don't really know. Is that an off the shelf unit, or is that something that you. It's just, it's just a simple, it's just, uh, you have a, have a capacitor to charge up your transistor, so when the person counts, it shorts that to the ground. And while it's charging, you have a shift in the logic. Okay, nice little school project. How to, uh, how to put a scale version using a big uh, <laughs> I mean, it's yeah, So that's assuming that it brings to a conversion type environment with a big equation. Would you use big equation conversion? Um, yeah, why not? Maybe. Yeah, I mean, it's just a little bit of design uh, over the life of the product. Uh, this is EMC. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's all sorts of reasons why you wouldn't. Have you had a look at any of them? No, but I mean, it's basically a hobby project, so. Uh, you have a certain concept. Yeah, I can take a question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I, I work for Circuit Go, but you can use the, uh, the Beagle Bone, so if you have a game you can use it for you, et cetera, et cetera. But where we make our, a lot of our money from is white label on this line, so you can rip off everything that would be an EMC header and it's expensive, like all the expansion headers. And we will custom to a design for you. So, so, so <laughs> that is the <laughs> question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, their DI the started a cake contest, so each design a custom cake, submit your design, and you can win a thousand bucks and cake your conversion. A thousand bucks? Yes. <laughs> you have fixed everyone. Uh, I would probably end up doing that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have a chat that way. So, so this, uh, this cape bus that you have been mentioning, is that something that you would see in mainland? Uh, <laughs> 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 okay, that's not good there. You will see something that works like that, but you might not see this if you press on There's been something special about absolutely fixing the need to support what cape bus does. Something like passive C public detection on the private uh, Yeah, no, no, you're not gonna see that. <laughs> that will work all. So there will be a few more presentations featuring Cape Bus uh, at ELC. So <laughs> pay attention to Matt Porter's talk and my talk and we'll go into a bit more Cape Bus details. If you are interested. <laughs> I have a question. Um, this is for uh, uh, telemetry. So, what kind of? Uh, that, I mean, in my mind, that makes sounds like something you have at a remote location. Mm -hmm. And uh, now, I think you log in via the Siri port or yeah, yeah, yeah. Page or something. What do? You, what kind? What kind of interface are you going to use? Well, in the future, <coughs> well, I plan on using a battery cable plus Wi-Fi. Okay. Yeah, that would be remote. Why do you think of working this project in the first place? That was fun. <laughs> 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 